Hi. I know it's it's kind of a fitting sort of thing for a quantum event. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. I just pop in and out of the universe. Exactly. It's almost like you planned it. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to everybody to our um, quantum event. Um, my name is Anne Merchant and I work for the National Academy of Sciences. And of course, I am as always joined by... I'm Rick Lovard. I'm the program director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is a program of the National Academy of Sciences. And it looked like you were about to say something. You were drawing breath like you. No, I was waiting. I was waiting for Anne to, to give me the moment to jump in. I was ready. <laughs> OK, well, I'm glad you were. I'm glad you were ready. Um, and we've got we've got a full agenda today and we have a really great event planned. So we will dive right in. And um, for those of you who are regulars, you know that that we have to do our job first and explain a little bit about um, where we work and what we do. And so, of course, um, my employer and Rick's employer is the National Academy of Sciences. And as always, the institution is very busy. We are a private nonprofit institution in Washington, D.C. Um, that helps, as we like to say, guide the nation with good science um, towards evidence-based policy. Um, and I always, every week, check the website. You'd think that I would kind of just know what's going on. But one of the things that happens when we're um, in, in isolation in our homes is that we don't just see our colleagues walk walking around the building and know uh, kind of just by conversation what they're doing. So it helps to orient ourselves when we go on our website and look at what's happening um, at our own institution. And so we have a new report on geoengineering and the Academy has called for the United States to cautiously um, begin to explore op options for geoengineering. I know there was a, um, a call through the academies to call this climate intervention, but I don't think that worked. So we're back to calling it geoengineering. Um, and so you can check that out on our website. We also, there's a really moving video from the National Academy of Medicine. It's NAM members uh, who are, it's Black African American uh, NAM members who are calling upon the Black community to take their COVID vaccines. We know there's a, some hesitancy in the African American community. And so the NAM members on their own have uh, put together this video calling upon their community um, to listen to them as emissaries and to, to please take the vaccine. So I urge you to check out that um, video and to share it if you feel that it's appropriate on your own social channels. And the other thing is that there's a new report out. It's really interesting. It's the science and ethics of new models. Uh, and I'm reading this, that's why I'm looking over here. Um, the science and ethics of new models of the brain and donated tissues. Um, it's a really interesting report that there there's a lot of ethics involved in the way that this research is being conducted, um, not the least of which is because when there is donated tissue, how that should be used in perpetuity. We've um, There have been ethical issues raised about that in the past. And then also the way in which animal models are being used and the perceived pain that animals or distress that animals may um, be in when we're doing this kind of research. So uh, there's a new report out from the academies on that, which I, all of this was brand new and pretty interesting. So it shows you the breadth of the work that's happening at the institution. Uh, but of course, not everyone's going to read the big reports that come from the academy. And that's why a program like the exchange exists. And it's why the that we do the events that we do. And so Rick, I'm going to hand it to you to explain about the exchange. Yeah, so the Science and Entertainment Exchange, it is a program of the National Academy of Sciences. If you're a writer, producer, director, a storyteller in any format, you have a question about science. Uh, and I actually got some questions this weekend while I was on a panel about like, well, what, is, what does that actually mean? You know, what, what do you guys really cover? And it's like, you know, science, technology, uh, uh, engineering, medicine, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a pretty broad field, so give us a try. Uh, and uh, we've done over uh, three or sorry, thirty three hundred consults since we started uh, over a decade ago, and over three hundred live events. But if you do have a question as you're uh, writing a story, please uh, contact us at eight four four need sci. And there you go, Sachi put it up in the in the chat there. We've worked on many many projects, including uh, Avengers: Infinity War, Black Panther, Captain Marvel, Songbird. Chernobyl. And if you're a STEM professional and you're just tuning in for the first time today and you're like, oh, whoa, what is this? I'd be interested in 
contacting us or being in touch with a storyteller, please do reach out. We're always looking for more volunteers to uh, connect with filmmakers and writers and producers. Um, I want to thank Ameche for AV today. Uh, we couldn't do these things without you. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Courtney and Jeff in DC, uh, the creative engagement team at the National Academy of Sciences and Sachi Gerben in Los Angeles on the Science and Entertainment Exchange. Um, so I would be remiss if I did not thank our sponsors, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, who makes this event possible. Uh, Howard Hughes has given us a grant to support all of our events, and we are enormously grateful there. Alfred B. Sloan Foundation, the Templeton Foundation, Walt Disney, Film Nation, Google, Lida Hill Foundation, Corteva, the San Diego Botanical Garden, and Cornell Alliance for Science. Uh, and many individual donors like you, if you've joined at the supporter level, especially if you joined today, thank you. We will be sending you one of these. There we go. I don't know if my green screen is taking it away from me. This year's color is copper. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, and if you haven't gotten your coin yet, it will be coming soon. And this isn't just a coin. It also uh, entitles you to uh, get into some of our uh, VIP Q&A uh, experiences. There will not be one of those today, but next week's event, there will be. Um, so the event structure today, we have an incredible screenwriter and an incredible physicist in conversation. If at any point in the conversation you have a question, you can put it either here or here, depending on what you're watching this on, it should say Q&A. You type that in and I will be behind the scenes feeding those questions to Kieran Fitzgerald, who will then be asking them of Carlo. You can ask a question of Kieran or of Carlo, mm -hmm. um, either way. And if we don't get to your question, it is on me. It is my fault, not Kieran. I'm sure I sent it to him. It just, uh, or I'm sure I didn't send it to him. It's my fault. Um, lastly, I think that's it. I think it's back to you, Anne. And now we got to talk about rabbit holes. I know we got to talk about rabbit holes. And, uh, it, it's a rabbit hole every week for the two of us to think about rabbit holes. But so I, I actually saw this really interesting article in the Washington Post about cast iron pans. And I treasure my cast iron pan. This is only one of them. I have a, a much bigger one. And the point that they were making was that a cast iron pan is, is something special. It's an heirloom. And I have a lot of very expensive cookware. Um, and uh, I actually turned to my cast iron pans, which I think this one cost maybe $15. It's a lodge um, because cast iron pans tell a story. Um, they are, they're a bit like us as human beings. They are resilient, but they, they thrive when they have um, constant care um, and they don't take a lot of care, but they take some care. They get better with time and they have a history and they do tell a story, whether it's the story of the, the perfect biscuits that you baked in them, the pan biscuits or the Sunday breakfast or the perfect pot stickers. And, and I actually would recommend there's a um, Cook's Illustrated process for curing your pans. It does take two days. And for that $16 pan, it takes a $25 uh, bottle of uh, flax oil, but it creates this perfect surface. I did this for my son when I gave him his, the gift of his own cast iron pan, and they will last a lifetime. So there are times where I look at my $300 copper pan and say, nope, I'm using my lodge. And so I highly recommend if you do not have a, a good old fashioned um, pan like that, go get one. They're awesome. I have no doubt, Anne, that your cast iron tells a story. I have eaten your <laughs> cooking before. Anne is quite the cook. I am not. Um, so uh, for my rabbit hole, I may or may not have, I can neither confirm nor deny that I was on a call with Ann Merchant and my mind drifted for just a moment, just a moment. And I thought to myself, when you look at the graphics, uh, you know, sort of like you're looking at like, uh, like, like just stuff that they put up as they're trying to show you like the, the back, mm -hmm. back end of a website, it always starts lorem ipsum. Yep. Like, what is that? Is that Latin? What is that? So I went down my own rabbit hole and I figured out that it's actually based on some text that was originally written by Cicero, which uh, I guess this is a placeholder for publishers for hundreds it, and hundreds, thousands It's always of years. been. I know. it's. Cr I didn't even know any of this. And it basically means more or less, I'm paraphrasing here, that sometimes you have to go through a little pain to get to toil, to get a task done but the ultimate pleasure of it can be very much worthwhile. Who knew? Give that. I did not know that. And I have to say, you know, we always just say, just put the lorem ipsum there. And I didn't know, I thought it was just sort of nonsense text. So that's very cool. 
So right now, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, two physicists. Uh, first, Spiro Michalakis, who is a Caltech physicist and creator of Ant-Man's Quantum Realm, longtime friend of the program. In fact, some of you may have seen him on an event here just a few weeks ago. Um, he introduced the exchange to a colleague of his at Bard, uh, who he, the two of them are uh, heading up a quantum century initiative and uh, his name is Paul Cadden Zemanski and I'll let them take it from here. Guys, here we go. There's Sparrow. Yay. Oh, no, and no. Paul. All right. So we'll let you guys explain a little bit about this from here and introduce our speakers. And thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Sam. Happy so, birthday, Spiro. Thank you. Happy birthday. Uh, so, and also, happy World Quantum Day. Indeed, April 14th. Right, so this is the inaugural uh, World Quantum Day, so, so decreed by uh, a whole consortium of people across the globe. I think there's about uh, 40 different countries involved, and you are the U.S. representative to this. Um, this was kind of just rolled out as the announcement for an annual World Quantum Day every April 14th. This is the first first year this is happening. And uh, there's events, I believe, on five continents today, this kind of being the capper, I think this is the last one. So we're clo closing the show for this year. Um, and all this is leading up to the big year 2025. And 2025 is the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the development of quantum mechanics. Uh, and so that's where the quantum century title comes from. It's uh, gonna be a global celebration of the past 100 years and all the different things that quantum mechanics has meant and developed and given us. And then also looking forward to the next 100 years with a lot of excitement towards what the future might bring in terms of technology, understanding, who knows? Yeah, and it's actually very exciting. The reason why we wanted to bring it up uh, within this context of uh, the exchange events is because we have a feeling that uh, many of you um, are on the entertainment side and we would really like your help to make this uh, Quantum Century event a success, right? To help us tell the stories because there's some amazing stories uh, both conceptually and biographically. Um, so it's also very exciting to us from our point of view to have Carlo and Kieran here today because they're both great storytellers. Um, uh, Kieran, for example, is, uh, is Emmy nominated uh, for investigative uh, journalism for um, one of his uh, documentary uh, films. He's also worked with Oliver Stone on Snowden. He's uh, written for Wormwood. I mean, he has, he has many accolades, but the thing that I love the most about Kieran is that we uh, basically got drunk together right before the pandemic uh, in Palm Springs and with Rick there. And uh, we spent a whole night, I think we went to sleep at four in the morning uh, and we talked about everything quantum. He had so many questions. So um, I thought I would give him the gift of, um, of asking questions to, to somebody who is uh, even better than me at uh, answering them, Carlo. So yeah, Paul, you know Carlo. Yeah, so uh, I mean, in some sense, the what we want this 2025 event to be is a giant ask me anything about quantum mechanics. Um, and just the fact that quantum is so pervasive in all sorts of things, we wouldn't be able to talk without it. Uh, our, our general feeling is that scientists have lots and lots of stories, but aren't always the best storytellers. So we're really hoping that we connect with some, some storytellers who can ask us questions and translate and to tell stories in a novel way. But occasionally you find that rare physicist uh, who's also an excellent storyteller, and uh, Carlo Rovelli is one of those rare individuals. So uh, he's written uh, numerous uh, popular books from uh, a book on Anaximander, the pre-Socratic philosopher, to Seven Brief Lessons on Physics, which has been translated into over 40 different languages. And uh, most appropriately, his newest book, which uh, I think you can get in the US uh, in a month or so, is called Helgoland, which is the island uh, off the coast of Germany where quantum mechanics was first uh, envisioned in kind of a fever dream of Werner Heisenberg. So uh, it's our pleasure to introduce Carl Rovelli and Kieran Fitzgerald. Yeah, you're in for a treat. Carlo, hi. Uh, this is a, a real honor for me. Um, as Spiro said, uh, I do like to ask questions, whether it's at four in the morning drunk in, in Palm Springs or otherwise. Um, 
And it, it really is um, a, a real privilege to be able to ask you questions here. I've been absolutely devouring your books. I've got them all around me right now. Um, and I cannot recommend uh, reading them highly enough. Um, and uh, so among other things, um, please go and, and take a look at Carlo's books, um, including the forthcoming Helgoland. Um, I'm just gonna start quickly by reading a passage that I think encapsulates so much of your um, thinking, which is so very humanistic in addition to being of course, insightful um, in a scientific sense. Uh, it's a passage from your book, Reality is Not What It Seems. And that in itself, I think, is a good way of understanding your body of work. And the passage is, I think that the obscurity of the theory, and here you're talking about quantum theory, is not the fault of quantum mechanics, but it's rather due to the limited capacity of our imagination. When we try to see the quantum world, we are rather like moles used to living underground to whom someone is trying to describe the Himalayas. So my hope is in 25 brief minutes, we can, um, uh, we can see the Himalayas through your eyes. And I think you're still muted, Carlo. Here I am, thank you. Um, no, we're not gonna see the Himalaya in 25 minutes, but thank you, this is a, uh, this is a great starting point. Um, look, let me say this, um, science is a, it's, it's a large enterprise, <clears throat> um, which, which goes in various directions, involves all sorts of people, and uh, uh, of course a lot of people in science get uh, fascinated by one specific thing uh, uh, they do, and it's full of details, a specific discovery or specific uh, thing uh, uh, found out. My book, I always struggle to sort of step back and see the large picture, because what fascinates me in science most uh, is the fact uh, that uh, it's really opened our eyes to a completely different view of the world. It changes the way we look at the world, uh, sometimes in ways which are not, uh, uh, not immediate, it takes time to digest, but have an enormous effect. So I'm, I'm fascinated by the big step, the big revolutions, in, in, uh, in science. And quantum mechanics, I mean, it's perhaps the biggest of all. Uh, uh, and we're going to get a, a, a quantum mechanics. But even if you think of the ones which, have, which we have well digested, like the Copernican revolution, right? I mean, you look around, you, nothing moves. This is the Earth, the you know, sun goes around. And then we discover, no, 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 that's all wrong. I mean, we are sitting on this crazy spinning rock. Um, we're just a little in a little corner of an immense universe, uh, and the reason we see the the, the 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 sky, the sun, and the moon going around us is not because they're doing anything. We are we we are spinning. It just makes your your head spin, and you you rearrange your understanding everything. Or you know, think about Darwin that told us that we're the same ancestors as uh, the ladybugs outside. I mean, that that little insect is. Uh, her grand, 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 grandmother is also my grand, grand, grandmother. And then you really think what it means to be a human somehow, yeah, with the casting of an insect. There's another quote of yours that you're making me think of, uh, of a Carlo Rovelli quote um, in, in your book, not to fear rethinking the world is the power of science. That's one of the things that seems to be a through line in all of your work, the idea that you know, it's through the power of imagination, you just sort of tear down everything that came before and start over again and see what things look like. That's it. And what is hard in science is not discover something new, is to unlearn things that we believe are obvious and they're not, right? I mean, the, the earth doesn't move, it's obvious. No, it's wrong. I mean, we're different from the animals, it's obvious. No, it's not. In quantum mechanics, uh, and I think it's wonderful, this idea of actually celebrating uh, the quantum day and the quantum century, because this it is, uh, I, it's, it's probably the greatest revolution in science. And probably we haven't, we haven't digested it yet. Even the scientists, I would say. It's really a, a radical rethinking of, uh, of reality. And, you know, I wish uh, uh, you work in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in movies, uh, and I think art, the great art, and, and movies are art, uh, be capable, as has done other times, to somehow reflect on this change of perspective on, 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 on reality that science comes, uh, comes in. So it's not just, uh, you know, the specific technological application, the specific funny phenomenon 
that of course it isn't sometimes uh, very uh, strange and funny, but it's really the rethinking of what things mean. And uh, you know, Einstein has told us that uh, time is not what we thought it is. Uh, that it makes no sense to ask what is happening now in a distant galaxy because the question is meaningless. It's truly meaningless. Um, so you can jump at different times and things like that. But the jumping at different times is a consequence of, uh, of, of realizing that what we think about time was wrong. Mm -hmm. Quantum mechanics is a consequence of realizing that what we think about matter was wrong. Mm. Okay, hold on, hold on that thought because I'm going to try and hopefully we can, if I can feel myself learning um, during the next 20 minutes. Maybe someone else out there will learn too. But t tell me a little bit more about, Paul mentioned the kind of fever dream on this island in the middle of the sea where quantum mechanics was conceived in the mind of Heisenberg. And tell me a little bit about that because it, it figures into your new book. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's a reason. We are in 1925. So it's a reason of we, we're celebrating the quantum century. We're, we're exactly 100 years. We're going to be soon 100 years from that. And, uh, and it's also the title of my book. Helgoland is the name of this island where this happened. And, uh, and the book opens with a description of the moment in which uh, so the first glimpse of quantum mechanics, uh, uh, the first solution, the step toward the solution of the problems the physicists had at this time, at that time happened. And what is fantastic is it was a kid because he was 23. Mm. Wow. You know, when, when you're young, you're radical and you, you, can, you have the courage of thinking something completely different. And he went to this island, it's a teeny island without trees, a rocky, uh, windy, uh, pretty wild uh, in, in, in the middle of the northern uh, sea between sort of Germ Germany, Denmark, and the UK. Uh, he went there because he, he was suffering from allergy, hay fever, so there are no trees, so no pollen. It's, it's a good place if you uh, suffer from allergy. But he went there for, to, to, to focus on his calculation and try to understand this mystery of how atoms work. Mm. It was this idea that an atom is a nucleus with some electron going around, but nobody was able to figure out what is how the electron goes around, what is the equation of the electron, what is the force that, uh, there was these jumps, these funny jumps that the electron does, but why, I mean, what's the force that can make a jump? And he was calculating, calculating, calculating. At some point, he found a way to compute exactly uh, the right things that were being seen by the experimenters at, at his time. So you get all excited in the middle of the night, and uh, the more you get the more excited, the more you make mistakes during calculation. So this trains for long and it comes late in the night. And finally, it gets to the end of the calculation. He tells the story himself in a, in a reminiscence of that, of that moment from his diaries. And then he sees something completely new. So he leaves everything there, walks out in the night, climbs one of these high rocks overlooking the ocean and sits on the high ro rock in the night waiting for the sun to come out, um, saying that he had the feeling of having been the first of having a completely new glimpse of reality. Mm -hmm. so, like in what you read, the, the mole that looks out from, the, from its underground and, and see the Himalayas. And what he has done, and you see, what he has done is incredible because everybody was trying to write an equation for the electron, a force for the electron. And he said, and you have to be 23 for doing these things, forget the equation for the electron, forget the force, we know the force, just the electric force with the atom. It's that the electron is not really a little particle moving around, it's something else. It's something else which I don't want even to describe. I only want to describe how I see the electron. Mm -hmm. So he renounced uh, the idea of describing a thing in itself mm -hmm. and, and, and only describe how things affect something else. And there was a calculus for that, a way of doing that mathematically. And boom, this little way of calculating, uh, he goes back to Göttingen and with some friends, most of us in his age, Dirac was the same age, uh, Jordan was the same age, Pauli was the same age. And, and together, they put together what we call quantum mechanics together. And you know, a few decades later, there is atomic power, atomic bomb, quantum computers, lasers, all sorts of medical applications, all sorts of incredible technology. It's just this, cal ca mm. this calculus that invented the island. And then with, just to briefly cover the history of quantum mechanics, there's a lot of resistance to this idea, right? Einstein is not very happy with this. Um, yeah, Einstein, 
uh, he immediately recognized that that was major. In fact, it's a high, I, I say himself that proposed Heisenberg for the Nobel Prize. So he, he said, okay, we, we have understood something important about, but what the hell does it mean that you cannot say where the electron is? You can only say when you see it. So what, what is going on? It's not clear yet. And Einstein tried hard to push Heisenberg and Bohr and the other involved in the early quantum mechanics to, to, to clarify what has been discovered. And in a sense, Einstein was right, because 100 years later, we're still, it's not completely clear yet mm. what quantum mechanics is. But this is part of the mystery of the difficulty. It's not, you see, it's not just a discovery of a fact. It's that we have to change our way of thinking about things, change our, uh, our, the eyes with which we, we view the world. When, in the Copernican revolution, mm. right, or when we discover that the Earth is round, mm. you say that's up. And that's down. There's no doubt about that. Okay, except that in Sydney, in Sydney, it's the other way around. So what do you mean by up? It depends where you are. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it's, not just, it's, it's not just a question of it's not just a question of having bigger and bigger particle colliders because I think a lot of people assume that well the proof is coming as soon as they've got a big enough particle collider and then some someone will you know release some major discovery on the front page of the New York Times that's not necessarily it. No, it's the other way around. The more we have bigger collider, the more we, we look into into the the the, the, the fine grained working of nature and the less our common way of thinking works. Mm. So uh, the more we look in the detail of things, like when we, more we look at the cosmos at large, the more we realize that our common worldview, you know, our common worldview is simple. I mean, this is my hand, this is my pen, this is my microphone, they are there, nothing to do with me. This is simple and uh, that's the way my brain gets used to reality to, to around me. But if I go to atoms or to galaxies, things are different. And, and, and science is this slow way of re-changing our conceptual perspective, uh, view of reality. Um, and quantum mechanics is a major step in that. And I maybe, think the core... Sure. Sorry, I was going to say, maybe you, can, maybe you can describe to us in brief sort of you know the, the the major focus of your uh, of your life and, and inquiry um, and in the the idea of loop quantum gravity um, and and what that how that figures into the evolution of our of our understanding of quantum mechanics. Yeah, uh, what what is fascinating in science is not just what we've learned, is what we don't know yet. And, uh, and science is a, it's something at the boundary. It's a, it's a process. It's, it's a process of uh, increasing our understanding. Um, so, uh, in fact, you people in the in the movie and in the even in the journalist world, uh, uh, I always uh, ask to to make it clear somehow, not to make not to confuse too much mm -hmm. what we know, which is spectacular and strange from the speculations. That sometimes they're very strange, but they may be wrong. I mean, what we know is already spectacular by itself. Um, but look, my own work uh, uh, in life has been uh, uh, trying to take the two biggest uh, and most fantastic revolutions of 20th century physics, uh, which is quantum mechanics is one, and the other is Einstein. What Einstein understood about space and time, you know, space moves, oscillates and stretches, and time is de changes depending how you move and where you are, and, and bring them together. Mm. because there should be a common story and this common story has not been understood yet. And so that's this quantum gravity. And quantum gravity is understanding the quantum property of space and time. So um, the strangeness of quantum mechanics, the fact that things are such only respect to something else, concerns space itself and time itself. You know, you, you, everybody has heard about in quantum mechanics, so you can talk about a Schrodinger cat that can be in one state and at the other at the same time. People say, dead and alive at the same time. I don't like dead and alive. I prefer uh, uh, awake and sleepy uh, and, uh, uh, and sleeping at the same time. Uh, that's a strange of quantum mechanics. When you don't look at something, this something by itself doesn't need to be in a state because the state is always related to you. So you can think of it as in two different states. So an electron can be here and also here. That's, a, that's what confuses us in quantum mechanics. This. Um, uh, this fact that when, when you don't look at things, they can be in, in, 
with, with respect to you, not in one position and in many positions, in many states. That's, that's my work. It's also true about space and time. So the shape of space and the passage of time can be not just one, but many at the same time. I'm, I've been working in this uh, theory, tentative theory, which is loop quantum gravity, which is a, uh, uh, a main attempt to do the quantum physics of space time. And there things become even more radical because you go to a world where you should not think that the world is situated in space or is situated in time or time passes. Space and time are themselves quantum phenomena that, that, that happen. Yeah, and, uh, let, let, me, let me restate that so I get my head around this. Um, yeah. Essentially you're saying that these space and time are not independent forces moving regardless of everything else. They are emerging from the particles themselves or loops, I guess. Exactly, the exactly. They're emerging from the, the quanta themselves from the individual things themselves. So uh, the right way of thinking about the world uh, in quantum gravity is not to start with space, not to start with time. So forget about that. Uh, you have entities and processes. And then in some approximation, if you look from, from a large scale, uh, you can think that there's a space and you can think there's a passing time. Uh, but this is approximated. Mm. You, you see, uh, it's, I, 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 I know well that I'm con 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 condensating in a few words uh, uh, a lot of strange stuff. Um, but that's what I find fascinating in, 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 uh, in science. The, the world, uh, the physical world is much more magical than all the, the fake uh, uh, fancy imagination that Hollywood creates. If you could, if you could describe that, that quantum world. I mean, if, I, if you could describe, you know, the the guy entering in a really quantum regime and navigating this shifting, continuously shifting reality and splitting and recombining in some way, I would love it. Yeah, we'll work on that. Yeah, <laughs> that's our job. I, I do think though that there's. Um, Something very uh, you described b before we, we began this talk. You you were sort of say, using something as simple as a T-shirt to describe loop quantum gravity. That you know it's like the the threads of a T-shirt, and and without the threads, there is no T-shirt, right? There is no space time continuum at all. Um, yes. You know that's that was that was helpful for me. I I'm also wondering though if this is a theory are. Are we going to, in our lifetime, see it proof? Do you think is that what would have to happen for this to become, you know, the kind of commonly accepted view of the universe? Um, we're not there yet. Uh, what we should happen is that the theory can be used for doing some predictions, and these predictions are verified. Uh, and that a lot of people are working on this, I'm working on this. So we're trying to apply this theory to black holes, what happened in the future to black holes, to the early universe, the big bang, to use the theory to describe the big bang and then compute you know, the cosmic background radiation and so on and so forth. Or the big bounce. I know in one of your, in one of exactly. your books, you talk about the possibility that the big bang is not uh, a bang exactly. at all, it's a bounce from the exactly. So one of, one of the things that seem to be coming from the theory, I think we, that this, now we have a theory of quantum gravity, so we can compute the big bang. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, the approximation is a lot of work. I mean, then the, the details are heavy and, uh, and, uh, and, and laborious. But what seems to be com coming out is that in fact, the Big Bang was not, a, was not an explosion from nothing, but you can see it as a, as a previous contracting phase that become very squeezed and then bounces, a big bounce. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. if this is right, there should be some, some visible effect of that. And we're trying to work and find them out. Yeah. And so it is. It is possible then. It, you, you could envision a world in which we look. I am not too young now, uh, but I hope before dying to see some some mounting evidence of uh, of that. But look, general relativity, nineteen fifteen. Uh, there were some uh, some predictions verified uh, one or two. Uh, in the next year, so people took it seriously. But the, it, it, it took decades 
before all the fantastic prediction, gravitational waves, black holes, uh, expansion of the universe, uh, uh, to, to be all confirmed. They were all, you know, delirious things. Nobody believed them at the beginning. Not even Einstein believed the, 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 the prediction of his own theory. Uh, and now it's, it's all confirmed. So it might take time. I hope before dying to see some confirmation of loop quantum gravity. But let me answer your question about the T-shirt. Yeah. So um, light, what is the quantum property of light? Light is it's a wave, right? An automatic wave. But when you look into small, uh, it's granular. It's made of photons. Mm. Like the photons are the quantum, this granularity is one of the peculiar aspect of, uh, of quantum mechanics. The name quantum, it's because quantum means a little packet of something. So light actually, uh, very physically, when it arrives on a screen, it arrives like little rainy little drops of stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the key things of quantum mechanics is granularity. Uh, now, this is also true when, when you do quantum gravity, gravity space-time, so space becomes granular. So you have quantile space. So you can imagine around you, what's be, be, between my fingers, there is some space, okay? So there are many, 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 very many little grain of grains of space. And these are attached to one another. So that's the loopy. The, the loop is that you can, you can follow these links attaching them and, and they form some loops. That, that's, a, that's a structure. So the obvious way of thinking about that, it's wrong, is to imagine all these grains moving in, in some space, right? It's, they have some space and they move around. That's completely wrong because there's no space in which they move. They are space themselves. Mm. So you describe uh, space as this granular stuff, it's quantum. So it's also fuzzy, it's also probabilistic, it's also superposition of different, but it's granular. And uh, so if we, if we could zoom in, in in any region of space between my finger, we would see these grains and, 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 and these lines that loop the grains one to the other. Uh, and the analogy with the t-shirt, you see, if you see, my, my t-shirt has threads in it, or my pool has threads in it, but it's not that the thread sits on the pool. If you take away the threads, there's no pool anymore, right? It's, a, it's made out of it. So this, this loops uh, weave space itself. And time. I mean, that, that's the other, see, seems to me, a critical mind-bending um, theme here is that they are also, time is also emergent here. Time doesn't exist. Yes, uh, my previous book is entirely devoted to, to the niche of time because I think what we have understood about time uh, it's, it is mind blowing uh, with Einstein, with Boltzmann uh, and, and with quantum gravity, step by step. Uh, so, and, and, and the short story is that the way we think about time usually, uh, it's very, very approximate. You know, it's just uh, misses a lot of things. And if you go to quantum gravity, all the way to quantum gravity, the basic equations of quantum gravity, there's no T, there's no time. You have processes, things that happen in the sense that uh, you have a process A, B, C, D, but there's no time in which this happened. Mm. So time is just the, the counting, if you want, an arbitrary way of, 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 count, of naming the, uh, in, in, in some sequence, the, 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 the events of the world. But now I have to ask you a question that will, you know, just pertain to uh, normal minds like my own. Um, given your work and what you've just described as the emergent nature of time, what do we think of something, you know, like time travel, which Hollywood has been in love with for a long time? Um, is it possible that if time is emergent, you know, theoretically, uh, there's a world in which we could go back in time um, or, or time could stand still? Um, I know these are sort of big, probably stupid concepts for, for when it comes to physics, but, but no, it, it's the way of helping us sort of understand, you know, just how um, mind-bending your work is. They're not stupid at all. In fact, these are questions that, uh, you know, bend the mind of, of, of physicists, philosophers, and, and, and it requires careful thinking, understanding what, what, what things mean. Um, I think that, yes, in principle, uh, it's, it, 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 it's, it's possible, certainly, well, it, uh, no, let, let me be more precise. We know for sure that it's possible, and it's just a matter of money, technology, to jump to the future, to the arbitrary faraway future. Hmm. 
So time traveling is what we do every day. We just wait and we time travel. But if you want to go to very much in the future, it's very easy. You just build a rocket, go very fast, come back, or go near a black hole, uh, like an interstellar, so wait a lot, come back, and you're back in uh, one year later for you and 100 years later for whoever's there. That's we know for sure. Right. We're confident about that. The interstellar formula, it works. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's that's not uh, Hollywood in the bad sense. That's <laughs> that's science. <laughs> um, can we go back? In the, can we go back? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I think yes in principle, but we should see what it means to go backward. You see, what it means to to go ahead in time. It means that tomorrow you remember you're you're saying you because you remember today. Hmm. Right. That's that's what it is. So you can be in the in in the past and remember the future. That's not impossible. Uh, what works against that? It's thermodynamics, probability. It's very improbable to build a situation in which this happens. So if one is careful of naming things and 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 uh, uh, everything becomes more clear, and you see why it's so unlikely that you know I, I meet you and you tell me uh, that you know what happened to me tomorrow. Um, so you don't come from tomorrow because you've not been there. Uh, but the dis difference between the past and the future is not in the things. We, it's wrong to think that the, the, the world is in the past and then is in the present and then is in the future. Mm. Uh, it's a much more complicated story in which the difference between the past and the future, uh, uh, it, it's built by, uh, by thermodynamic probability, by our lack of knowledge of the details. If we could know everything, past, future, and present would be indistinguishable. Hmm. Oh, um, I, this, this requires, um, uh, I know a few hours this requires to get to, or, or maybe a few lifetimes, but I am being, um, asked to move on to, uh, to questions, um, here. Okay. Oh, so I'm, time gonna, flies. I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to ask a few, um, this is a question from Joe is reality at its ultimate origin unknowable. Um, well, this is a great question. Um, let me let me tell you what I think. Uh, what we know is that uh, we can know a lot about reality, and uh, we are far from knowing everything, obviously, because there are, there are many laws that we don't know, and there are many facts that we don't know. Mm. And we can know more and more. Now, does it make sense to say that something is a priori novel, a priori unknowable? No, I don't think it makes sense. Because for us, reality is it's, uh, it's what we know and what we discover. I think mm. it's wrong to imagine that there's down there the final story, the complete story, which is not accessible to us. I mean, forget about this complete story. That's not of interest to us. What is interesting to us is what we see and what we can discover uh, beyond the hill somehow step by step i have to ask this question because it's just too good um this is from tiffany uh rick's wife who's a huge fan of yours if heat determines the arrow of time does that mean that my refrigerator is a time machine <laughs> unfortunately not it's a great question <laughs> it is true that heat determines the um the arrow of time um but uh uh, I mean, I, I could go into details. Perhaps answering a question like that is not uh, is not the moment of going into detail. But I, I'm, we're I'm all sorry. ready to get inside our I'm refrigerator. Sorry, Tiffany, you, you cannot go back to yesterday by entering your refrigerator. I'm sure yeah. about that. We are all sure about that. That's good. Okay. <laughs> um, but and, and, and another question um, uh, from Tiffany is the scale of our time dictated by our neurological processes. And it yeah. seems like in, in, in order of time, that is something that you're contending. Yeah. 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 Because uh, definitely, yes. Because you see, what we mean by time, and that's the, the entire point of my book, uh, it's a lot of different things. And uh, we get confused when we mix these things up. So there's something which is time, uh, which is the, the, the equation of the pendulum, a pendulum with a tick tack, and that's something. But for us, time is not just that. For us, time is something that flows, and we have a sense of uh, also the speed at which it flows, sense of something being far away, something we close, and so on. And this does not 
follows from the laws of physics alone. It follows from the specific working on our brain. We have some memories that span a certain amount of time with an anticipation. So what time is for us is really this uh, embracing a little bit of past, a little bit of future. So the experiential time is not the same thing as the physical time. Mm. They're not incompatible. But to get an experiential time, you need a brain, you need memories, you need all the stuff. So um, the, 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 the sense of which, the, the speed at which time passes has nothing to do with physics. There's no speed at which time passes in physics. It has to do with our, the working of a brain. And I, I mean, I think that this last year uh, of a pandemic, I think has put people very much in touch with the, the, um, yeah. the reality for humans, the time, the passage of time changes based on your experience. You know, it feels different if you're staying at home all day. Completely. If you, yeah. And if you have nothing to do, you're bored in an afternoon, with definitely the time changes the speed at which it goes. Yeah, yeah. All right. This is, this is a, uh, um, a question, sounds like a physicist here from Angela. Would looping quantum gravity be the way to unify quantum mechanics and Einstein's theory of relativity? Would Planck's mass be the limit for this convergence with gravity, that's above my pay grade. I don't know what that means. <laughs> what do you do? The, the answer to the first part of the question is yes. I mean, look, quantum gravity is the theory that uh, um, uh, uh, brings together generativity and quantum mechanics. What we don't know is whether it's the right theory uh, because we don't have, we're, we're physicists, we need an experiment to believe something. Um, the second question about the Planck mass, uh, um, I think she what she means is whether uh, if I interpret correctly, is whether um, the Planck mass would set a limit where we don't see quantum phenomena anymore. And I don't think this is so. I mean, this has been suggested by some people, Roger Penrose, for instance, who got the Nobel yeah. Prize recently. Uh, but that's not what comes from, um, from loop quantum gravity. So in loop quantum gravity, quantum mechanics is true, is correct. And generativity is true in the classical limit. It has to be corrected by quantum effects. Um, this one, I'm I, I really curious to know your response to. Gary asks, are you familiar with the holographic universe concept? Yeah. Uh, and if so, what are your thoughts about it? My Maybe thought you can about... summarize it for a second because I, um, so people know what that is. Yeah. yeah. So this is an idea of which many of my colleagues uh, uh, fell in love recently. Mm. Uh, and they have been completely, you know, uh, flushed on the way of Damascus by the idea of holography. And the idea is that uh, um, somehow if you want to describe what happened in a region, everything you can say can be said about the boundary of it. Mm -hmm. So everything is not really three-dimensional, it's two-dimensional, it's on the surface. And an hologram, it's, you know, it, it's a three-dimensional image, but it's really two-dimensional. Two it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a way of squeezing three-dimensional into two. So uh, there is some hints from black holes that there is something like that in, in reality when, when you think about gravity. And I think the hints are interesting. And the, the, uh, so there's something holographic in some sense. Uh, you can look at the surface. But a lot of my colleagues have taken this as a dogma and only consider theories which are holographic because they love it. And mm -hmm. my opinion, it's a scientific opinion, I'll disagree, is that they're wrong. They are, uh, they are taking too seriously a, a, an idea, which might be a good idea, but they're making it in a dogma in a way that I don't think nature likes holograms so much. What I'm gonna ask a follow-up to that because it's, 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 uh, it's such a buzzword in, in, in Hollywood, the multiverse. We have a movie, a number of movies about the multiverse. Is, how do you feel about this idea? Um, uh, I'm also not very taken by the multiverse. It's, a, it's not a priori is impossible that there are other universes. What, what do we know? We just look around. But I don't see sufficient evidence that uh, to, to take the multi-universe idea seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can throw all sorts of ideas, but that's not good science, in my opinion. What, uh, the, in, what, what the idea of the multiverse has been able to do is only to provide some tentative justification for some numbers. But, you know, 
you cannot explain one number using infinite universe. The good science is the opposite. You, you, you explain, that's what Newton did. He explained an incredible variety of phenomena with just one constant, not the other way around. So I don't think, uh, I'm not convinced uh, that there is evidence for having today theories about other universes. They seem right. to me speculation so far. I may be wrong. Now to move on to um, something even bigger, I, I, I'm, I've got to ask this question. Um, I'm really curious as well. Um, uh, what are your thoughts about God? Um, you know, how do you, how do you come down on, on um, questions about um, religious creation, spirituality, who created space and time? Um, maybe you could speak to that. Yeah, I may say two things. One is that uh, uh, I'm an atheist. Uh, I've been for most of my life very happily and serenely and without any doubt about that, the way you, we humans uh, do not have doubts. Um, however, let me put a comma here. Uh, because just like that, it's, it's, uh, I don't think it's reflect my position. Um, however, I think that uh, when people say God, uh, everybody means something different, mm -hmm. incredibly different. Uh, it's a creator of the universe, it's a spiritual force, it's my father, it's a person I relate to personally, something deep inside me, it's all sorts of different things. Uh, it's so vague, this word that people can turn around and, uh, you know, Einstein, who's an atheist, he said very openly, he was using God all the time in his speech. Mm. Uh, and I think when people talk about their religious feelings uh, and their religions and their spirituality, they're not, talking non they're not talking nonsense. They're talking about some real phenomenon that happened in them. And it's not just a marginal phenomenon. Sometimes it's a central aspect of the life of people. And I think there's nothing fake in that. It's just that uh, um, if you ask me whether I believe that there is a person who created the universe, uh, my instinct is saying, oh, come on. It's just nonsense. What about a, 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 cor a, a corollary to this question? We were going to touch on it. Um, the idea of free will. Um, you know, do you feel um, that there's a deterministic you know, is our universe deterministic or not? Um, uh, where does free will enter into your thinking um, and how? Um, I gave a talk about free will yesterday. Uh, let, me, let me give a, a, a careful answer here. Uh, I believe I'm free. I believe it's me who decide, not somebody else. I believe what comes out of my decisions comes out from processes that haps, happen in me. So mm -hmm. I'm responsible for that and so on and so forth. I believe the law can punish me and it's okay if I do so, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so in that sense, I think there is free will, but I think it's a mistake if we interpret that as uh, we sort of uh, um, violating the laws of nature uh, uh, and acting from the outside. I think that uh, oh, what happens is uh, it's governed by the laws of nature, uh, deterministic in the classical limit, and there's some probability in quantum mechanics. So it's not really deterministic, there's some probability in quantum mechanics. And uh, part of nature that does things is me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing, I'm doing things. So if you, if by free will, you really mean uh, something which is separated from the laws of nature happening, no, there's no free will. Mm. But, uh, but there is free will in all the usual senses of the world. I mean, the, that guy did that. Was it free when he did it or it was not free? Well, he was free, so therefore he's culpable. What about, just to hit one more big idea here before we go, what about the afterlife? I mean, I, you know, one of the amazing things about your work is that it's clear you you uh, you know you really speak about the relation between everything, whether that's a human observer with eyes or, or simply one end of a magnet, as important and full of information. So, what what does what does your work lead us lead you to believe will happen after we die, right? Will 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 we sort of continue in the universe in some way that you, that it, that makes sense to talk about? Um. 
<laughs> Once again, so it, it, it's a similar to previous answer. Uh, if there's one thing I'm sure about to the extent in which you humans are sure about something is that there's no afterlife for me in the sense that my soul is going somewhere and, and, and looking for a way. I think the death is death, period. I mean, once I'm dead, my subjectivity uh, is not there anymore. I, it's like before I was born, it just was not there. I will not be there. And uh, I don't find this particularly scaring or boring or anything. I just think, you know, I was not there before being born. I will not be there before being died. Maybe I'm afraid of the dying passage, mm -hmm. suffering, whatever. Uh, having said so, however, and that's again my however, um, I don't believe that I am an entity by itself. I am a complex set of phenomena, uh, which is, uh, I'm a lot, not only my physical interactions uh, with the air around me, with the light, with the object that I touch, but also the idea exchanges with you, the image you have of me, uh, the love I have with people around me and they love me and I love them. So I recognize myself, who is Carlo? It's, it's, it's a complex narrative that I have and other have. Uh, and my identity is really in this network of relation. You know, I think of quantum mechanics as a network of things interacting with one another. And I think of myself as this network. And in that sense, my father died two years ago, three years ago. He's with me enormously. I mean, I still love him. I still hear his voice telling me, Carlo, you shouldn't do that. And when I'm in that, I think, what, 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 dad, what, what should I do here? And I have a conversation with him that continues. So in that sense, um, it's beautiful that he's still alive. And he definitely is still alive. And I think I will be still alive, I hope, at least a little bit, certainly not for too long. Uh, in, in, in the memory of other peoples. And that's beautiful. Uh, also that it was not gonna last long because nothing will last long. At some point there will be no me, no people who remember me, no love uh, around me, no humanity, no solar system. Wonderful. Life is be beautiful because it's brief. Well, I think we, we will leave it there. I wish our time was not as brief, um, but thank you. Um, uh, this is, um, uh, you know, uh, for, for trying to cram all of this into one hour, it's um, a, uh, an appropriate feat for talking about small things. Um, <laughs> my, uh, and, and, and again, your book, Helgoland, is coming out at the end of May. That's right, Carlo? Yeah, that's right. May 25th. May 25th. Okay. Um, Thank you. I mean, you, 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 you started by having me talk about physics and you took me in a, in a larger and larger domains, but I'm grateful for that. It's a, it's a good, good uh, it's a wonderful exchange. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, no, this was really enlightening. And Rick is, uh, you guys are back. Hi. It's like magic. <laughs> That was amazing. That was an amazing talk. Carlo, thank you. And Kiran, thank you for all of the work you did and getting your head around Carlo's work. To make I it. know. We, you did your homework, Kiran. Congratulations to you. It's my pleasure, really. Um, no, I'm a convert. Um, I, I really am. <laughs> And I think I, I want to take up Carlos' challenge to write a movie about loop quantum gravity. Oh, fantastic! You, yeah. uh, count on me as much as you want. <laughs> challenge accepted. Yeah, I hope someone from from Marvel's out there listening. <laughs> well, listen, then you will have done the Science and Entertainment Exchange proud. It's exactly the kind of thing we can put into a grant report. So thank you both for that. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Thank you. Um, thank you. I don't, I don't think this will be our last event around uh, the quantum century. And no. I know 2025 is another big year for quantum. So uh, hopefully we can uh, do something with that in the future. But next week, and yes. you want to tell them? Yes, about we have Elizabeth Loftus, who is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. She has been on our uh, non-virtual stage, our, our in real life uh, stage in the past. And she is a really interesting and compelling speaker. Um, so she studies um, human consciousness and the brain, and in particular studies memory. Um, so we hope that you will be back next week. It promises to be a very interesting conversation. Uh, we know that we, she is memorable to us, but I think she gives us a very interesting perspective on how human memory works. So please come back next week. We'll have the invitation in your email box soon. Sachi will get that out to you. And so we hope we see you next week.
Oh, and thank you to Spiro and Paul for yes. uh, coming to us with this event. Uh, this was fantastic. You guys are incredible, and I, I hope we get to do it again. Exactly. So again, happy birthday, Spiro. Happy birthday, Spiro. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Talk Bye-bye. Soon.